good morning and welcome to this forasi session on uh, democratic process we have a very distinguished panel today we have eko aho former prime minister of finland we have vaira uh, vike freiberger former president of latvia we have kingsley mogalu former candidate and a future president of nigeria uh, we have randa pani a great entrepreneur who is making up america and is very concerned about the american day and we have uh, the gunase garam from malaysia uh, a great academic he heads uh, the, the secar institute there uh, between the the panel brings together political experience in democracies uh private sector experience uh, uh uh prime minister asko aho has also worked in the corporates uh president uh, uh vike freiberga has been president of the uh, club the madrid which is a club of the former heads of states and heads of government and she has been on large number of uh, uh, intergovernmental and international bodies uh gunase vardhan besides uh being the director of the institute is also uh, an editor and and a commentator and so is anda she is also been a commentator in leading american newspapers she has worked in the administration in the department of uh, energy and kinsley also combines political experience with uh, private sector experience he heads uh, uh, an investment firm a global and plus he heads a it's an institute so we have a very very rich panel and the question we are asking is uh, are democratic processes effective are uh, uh, are they uh, delivering what is required for servicing the humanity uh, no. is there a difference between democracy in theory and democracy in practice is there a difference between non existence of democracy and presence of democracy and so we will start with uh, opening comments uh, by esco aho uh, over to you esco thank you so much i i'm trying to be very brief uh, i have only two comments uh, for the first uh, uh, there is nothing new under sun so so the fact is that we have seen also earlier uh, periods of time when when democracies have been challenged uh, when uh, reading history of europe in the 1930s you can see a lot of similarities uh with uh, the present situation democratic institution are challenged that is a fact of life in, the, in today's uh, world secondly uh, there is a military strategy called oda loop o o d a loop uh, o means uh, first o means uh, observe second o orient uh, d means decide and finally a act and um, i think this this is something democratic institution should keep in mind democracy should be effective as well we are rather good in analyzing uh, in uh, providing uh, observations even orienting into the new but the fact is that democratic institutions today have a lot of weaknesses in decision making and especially in execution of decisions if we want to Uh, uh fight with uh, with uh, populism and, and win populist movements uh which are sometimes against democratic principles we have to be able to to show that we are efficient we can we can bring not only statements and strategies but also concrete results that's my final comment thank you thank you uh let's go uh where uh, your experience is in an environment where there was no democracy and there is democracy so how do you look at uh, uh how, how do you look at this issue well first of all people uh, who haven't recently or in recent memory experienced the contrary uh should read history and and then they'll realize uh how fortunate they are in if they live in a democracy Well, my country starting with the second world war uh had two occupations by by quite nasty 
totalitarian powers and the Nazis were defeated, uh, but the communists, by allied them, allying themselves with the Western powers, uh, kept influence not only over the Soviet Union, but also a great part of, of, of the world, well, the whole of the Balkans and uh, uh, a large part of Eastern Europe, part of Germany. Uh, for all these nations, uh, including mine, uh, a democracy means uh, being practically freed from slavery because in uh, an absolutist system where not only are you occupied by the military forces and and, and we had nearly 100,000 troops in a country of, of uh, 2 million uh, people, uh, foreign occupying troops, uh, we didn't get rid of them until some years after recovering our independence in 1991. So you appreciate the absence of foreign military occupation, the absence of uh, uh, directives coming from some other place than your own capital, uh, and most of all between uh, either a theocracy or a totalitarian or an authoritarian system, uh, uh, such as the, the communist system was, and under Stalin it was absolutely totalitarian, is that it forces you to think in one way and in one way only. And I think that the, the physical occupation, uh, the uh, uh, sort of uh, the rights of the individual, the rights of your language, of communicating in the way you wish, uh, the dignity of the individual is one thing. But when you are imposed, when painters are told how to paint, musicians are told, how they should be composing in a party spirit. Uh, writers, are, are it's the worst situation. Poets have to sing poems about how Stalin loves the Latvian people and how the Latvian people love Stalin. And unless you do that, you cannot be published. Then you realize that it's a spiritual slavery that is imposed by such systems. And when you finally get independence, sovereignty, and democracy, then that is the first and uh, sine qua non of developing further. The next steps in democracy, uh, in developing a democracy that works, the human factors come in. The societal values, uh, the history of the nation, uh, its historic memory, uh, its sense of self-confidence or the absence of it, its sense of identity or the absence of it, and the moral values that they have been managing to keep in spite of the previous historical conditions. The human factor comes in and I'd like to return to it in our later, uh, later discussions. Okay, thank you, Vera. Things like uh, Nigeria has gone through some of the similar experiences okay. where you don't have democracy, you have democracy. So, so to what extent do you agree with Vera and what's your own perspective? Kingsley, can you hear me, Kingsley? Um, I'm sorry, my network is a bit unstable. Uh, yes, I can hear you. Um, I'll, I'll try to say a few things quickly. Um, in, in my experience, I, I am involved in democracy in Africa. Uh, we are trying to do so against the background of uh, a long history of military dictatorships over about three decades, starting from the 1960s. And there is the challenge of whether or not democracy in Nigeria, for example, my country, is real or whether it's ritualistic elections every four years simply to perpetuate uh, the power or to legitimize uh, the power of uh, very influential cabals. Or are the people really in charge of their destiny? Um, I, I would say that my personal experience from Nigeria as a developing country is that uh, the people are not truly um, in charge of their destiny in the context of the kind of democracy we practice. And we're trying to change this. We're trying to improve the democratic space in Nigeria. Justly going on about the constitutional right of free expression. Uh, uh, versus the government asserting its right to control its cyberspace. 
Now, we also have challenge of whether democracy brings economic development. Again, we have not. Personally, in Nigeria, uh, have the experience that democracy has brought accountability um, in Nigeria is still in a very infant stage. Uh, voters would occasionally vote out a politician for non-performance, um, but many times um, the democratic process is simply the outcome of backroom deals. And then, of course, we have the challenge of populism. I'm very moved by what I saw in the United States um, in the past year. <laughs> Randy may have, may have more to say about that. Um, but I was shocked that a country that we are looking up to, or we are taught to look up to, as a, as a banner of democracy. Um, and you find that um, certain politicians there, as we say, are very Nigerian, um, <laughs> perhaps even more so than the Nigerians themselves. And so this has been very disconcerting to see that a country that is so advanced, uh, that people can be moved and manipulated in a certain way. And you begin to even see statues of of human beings at political conventions. And you begin to wonder, how is this possible in a Western uh, country? So, you know, but I think democracy is a work in progress, whether in America, uh, whether in Latvia, whether in Finland, in India, um, in Nigeria, we must continue to work at it. Um, I think it was Winston Churchill who said, it's the worst system except for all the rest. Try communism, uh, try, uh, you know, military dictatorships. Um, try fascism. So it's, it's challenging. We're in the early stages in my part of the world, um, but I'm, I'm determined to continue to be part of the process. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Oh, okay. I, I, I had wrapped up. I'm sorry uh, about my connection, but I had finished my comments. Right. I think we may have lost our moderator. So yep. Yep. why don't we pick up where you left off, which I think is... Uh, a the monsoon rains that yep. he was warning us about. I think so. Um, so this is a great segue. I'm sitting here in Washington, D.C., albeit at 2 a.m., but Washington never sleeps. And as I was reflecting upon the title of our seminar today, and it's such a pleasure to be with all of you, thought a little bit about what it means, the democratic process and the power of humanity. Um, you know, here in America, we are taught at a very young age about American history. And in fact, we're coming up on July 4th, which is the day that we Americans celebrate our independence from uh, from the UK, from England, from King George, uh, from our occupation, if you will. Um, and, you know, a lot of it is very idealized. We have a very popular Broadway show now that's been running for a very long time. It's quite a phenomenon called Hamilton, about Alexander Hamilton, one of our founding fathers. And uh, we love it but it is very idealized. And it, it got me thinking as someone who's had experience in, I worked for a United States Senator as his legal counsel. I have argued before the Supreme Court as a lawyer, and I've worked for a president of the United States in the executive branch. And it, it got me reflecting upon what we're taught as young children, what democracy means. And we're taught about the origins of democracy uh, particularly with due respect to Greece and the, you know, uh, history of, of how democracy evolved. Um, however, we are taught that democracy in America is about the power of the people. We're taught that our government in its form is about the people and the people rule. But is it really that? And um, and I look at the three branches. I drive every day behind, you know, in front of the White House and the Supreme Court and our U.S. Capitol, less so now because of both COVID and the security situation. But I do look and think, well, you know, our Supreme Court are justices appointed 
uh, by the president and certainly confirmed by our Senate. Um, our president, our executive branch, is, as many of you know, isn't really power by the people. It's run by something called the Electoral College. And there have been instances in our history in America where an individual has won the popular vote but has not won the Electoral College. Um, and then you see our legislative branch, which you know sometimes works and sometimes doesn't, particularly in our two-party system. And we're effectively a two-party system in America, Democrats and Republicans. And if it if it doesn't work, it's because it's too close um, or too far. And lately, most certainly, our politics in America has become very polarized, extraordinary, extraordinarily polarized, and I would even say manipulated, uh, to the point where uh, we need to get back to the title of our seminar, which is the power of humanity, not necessarily the power of the people. And, um, you know, we saw, you know, after it goes without mentioning, and then I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll close. But on, you know, January 6th, we all witnessed something we never thought we would before, um, which was an insurrection. Um, no sugarcoating this. And I'm a Republican. I'm of the party that many of these people proclaim to be, but may not actually be. We saw an insurrection, an attempt to overthrow the democratic process of finalizing the count of our electoral college and, um, you know, formalizing the election of, of President Joseph Biden. Um, and it was a frightening sight for all of us in America. We've never seen anything like that before. And of course, we asked ourselves, how did we get here? How can we prevent this uh, from happening again? But you know, I'll, I'll end by saying, you know, we always do think we're the gold standard here in America, but we are ever evolving. Okay, I'm back. <laughs> so, sorry, I don't want to disrupt. You can continue. I'm finished. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, it's... Uh, where are we now? Because I got. Uh, I'm supposed to speak next. Yes. Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, okay. go ahead. Yeah. All right. Is it, I think uh, we need to look at democracy as more than one man, one vote. So it, it's, it's a process, it's a procedure, it's history and things like that. You have a constitution typically at the most basic level that provides a balance between the executive the legislative and the judiciary. And uh, the institutions which ensure democratic, uh, democracy are supposed to be larger than those people who run government itself. So you're talking about uh, things like parliament and independent judiciary, uh, non-corrupt and uh, independent enforcement law agencies, and including an anti-corruption uh, commission and so on. But if these instruments are subverted and corrupted, then you have a situation that is not that is not democratic, even though you have one man one vote uh, elections regularly. You know? So uh, take Mal if you if you take my country Malaysia for instance, you have a government which has been in power for sixty one years since independence. It has changed the constitution over a hundred times. Uh, over uh, over a period of time, it became increasingly draconian. And then it, it uh, used outdated legislation, uh, some dating back to the colonial administration uh, uh, to control and subjugate the people. So it eventually became a kleptocracy uh, in, uh, from around 2013 onwards. Uh, yeah? Sorry? So it became a kleptocracy eventually and was... Oh, can you all hear me? Can we go on? Yes, please. Okay. So, so the uh, it, it eventually became a kleptocracy where uh, some government officials, and in this case, the prime minister, was actually stealing money from the country. 
And um, it, I, I was uh, at that time uh, a journalist, as I am now partly. And uh, the us uh, journalists wrote about uh, this, and uh, I wrote a book subsequently after the 2018 May elections on uh, one MDB. Uh, you all may have heard of one MDB, which was the which was a vessel which was used to siphon many money out of the uh, uh, out of the uh, out of uh, the government. You know, so this. Uh, and uh, the the highlighting of this by many journalists, uh, including um, uh, us, uh, resulted in the overthrow of the government in May 2018. The the government which was uh, ruling Malaysia for 61 years, which is dominated by AMNO, uh, which is a Malay-based party. And uh, the new government promised reform and transparency, accountability, and good governance, and so on. But uh, induced by party hopping, the new government was uh, eventually overthrown uh, less than two years later. And uh, the AMNO is now, parting of, uh, part, now part of the ruling coalition. So the message from this uh, is it is not enough to win elections. The real change is to impl implement reform and meaningful changes quickly, which will prevent a recurrence from the old form of uh, non undemocratic democracy if you will you know? so uh, so while uh, humanity you can say kicked out of kleptocracy backroom dealings uh, as uh, kingsley mentioned earlier restored the old order to power but in uh, uh, asko i have a question uh, uh, for you please in entire in entire scandinavia uh, by and large, it is assumed, whether it is Finland or Denmark or uh, Sweden or Norway, that uh, de democracy is practiced in an ideal way. On every indicator, you are on the top, the Scandinavian countries. Uh, sometimes this country is number one, sometimes that country is number two. But by and large, uh, whenever there is any uh, uh, global indica indicator of uh, good governance, of democratic practice, not just uh, elections, but also democratic practice, so Scandinavia is always on the top. So what is the distinct Scandinavian characteristic that, that puts Scandinavia on the top? I think it's important to understand that uh, democratic system uh, is not able to be developed in isolation. It's, uh, it's integrated into certain basic elements in the society. <clears throat> and if you look back the Nordic countries, all the, all the five Nordic countries, I think there are three major common features which are explaining why democratic institutions and democratic system is deeply rooted in, in this part of the world. For the first, we have a long tradition of rule of law. Finland was part of Russia for more than one century. Russia did not have and doesn't have even today the rule of law. But we were able to inherit that uh, prince, uh, those basic principles from, from Sweden when we were part of Sweden until 1809, before, before becoming part of the, of the Russian Empire. And I think this is one fundamental thing, the rule of law. Secondly, uh, trust in institutions. And it's, uh, it's not only a question of, uh, of uh, democratic principles, but, but the, the idea that institutions are serving society and uh, individuals and individuals' interests. And all are equally treated. That, that's uh, fundamental as well. So combination of the rule of law and, uh, and uh, trust in the institutions is critical. And finally, social mobility. I don't believe in any society being able to, to preserve democratic principles and democracy if there is no social mobility. And, and I think it has worked in the Nordic countries quite well. And the main reason for that is uh, uh, educational system, investments in education and trust that through education you can get better. I think these are the three principles that are able to explain why Nordics are uh, still doing quite well. Oh, that's very good. Thank you. And Vaira, you are so closely uh, uh, situated to the Nordic countries, 
but at the same time you also had the whole experience of the of the russian rule uh, so how would you describe the societies in not only uh, uh, latvia but also estonia uh, lithuania in your era region in terms of the maturity to implement democracy using some of the criteria we just got from uh, from uh, esco uh, we have partly uh, the same history of of having been uh, under uh, swedish rule uh, for a period and then in the 18th century the last uh, the last part of latvia uh, was taken over by by the tsarist uh, empire in 1795 so uh, that's not that terribly long ago um the uh, revolution of 1917 that uh, overthrew the tsarist government uh had a, a very active participation of the of the red riflemen of, of the La- uh, latvian riflemen who uh participated in overthrowing the tsarist government uh because uh they felt that it had become intolerably oppressive uh to the to the people uh afterwards uh when independence was declared in 1918 uh we had 20 years of independence during okay. which we had an opportunity uh, to move away from the systems that had been established in tsarist times and start developing our own national uh, independent and hopefully uh, democratic uh, system it was a time in europe when uh, nations were looking to leaders and but all three countries at the very end before the war uh had either prime ministers or or uh, presidents who uh, who had uh, who took on a sort of war of leadership in uh, if you like personality cult type of thing but nonetheless the 20 years of experience of independence helped these three countries i think okay. change over and to catch up to western democracies much faster than our fellow uh sufferers if you like uh in uh, other parts of, of the former soviet union some of whom have done better and have come closer uh to building up democratic systems and some not in our case a great stimulus was our desire to accede uh to uh, the european union uh as well as to become members of the uh north atlantic treaty alliance for our security these were um if you like goads uh that pushed uh, helped us push through um uh, huge reforms in a very uh, short time uh during my presidency i was 8 years president between uh, 1999 and 2007 we joined both nato and and the eu in 2004 uh i would be signing hundreds of new bills a week uh to uh for latvia to be able to ad- uh, to adopt what is called the aki communautaire all the laws uh, that had been developed by the european union since its creation and with that uh with that help uh, we were able structurally to approach democratic systems the psychological understanding of what it means to be free what it means to be responsible as a democratic citizen uh, the Uh, what a political party means I mean, after 50 years of a communist party telling you uh, what to do what to think and and so on and so on the idea of multi party system uh, uh how what does it really mean to belong to a party and so on that is something uh, that uh, i think is still an ongoing process we do not have stable parties the uh, every every uh, parliamentary election there's some new party that comes in and some old party that drops out oh, okay. and some who stay the same and how do you look at the future prospects of the entire region which was uh, early part of the soviet union and today is outside of russia like ukraine belarus uh, and and uh, uh, other countries which earlier form, uh, formed a part of the soviet union how do you look at say medium to long term future next 10 15 years and not to well, mention of course uh, the baltic i things. think it's uh, what we had in our countries was a singing revolution in all all three countries there was a, a truly an awakening of consciousness 
uh, of wishing to change the system. And this is uh, before even all our uh, efforts to join the European Union. Uh, we wanted to rejoin the rest of the free world. And that means for us, it means uh, the rest uh, of Europe, uh, but to the West from us. Uh, we feel that those countries like Moldova, like Ukraine and, and some others who felt, well, they were not quite ready yet uh, to break the ties with the Russian Federation because they had been established uh, extremely. Uh, the, the Soviet Union had taken great, great care to build up a system where all countries were interdependent, for instance, in terms of supplies of energy, supplies of raw materials, and so on and so forth. So these countries felt well, we have certain gas was uh, being offered to, to Ukraine um, at uh, below market prices and they could resell it at market prices. This was a great temptation uh, uh, and they, uh, they fell for it. <laughs> uh, and they lost, uh, many, many leading uh, Ukrainians now admit they lost time instead of handling reforms that needed to be done uh, uh, you know, taking the bull by the horn uh, and changing, they thought, oh, we'll coast along with, with the old habits. So, well, we have our flag now and we have lots of things, but you know, let's, let's stay in a way linked up to the old way of doing things. And uh, I believe it's the determination to change. Uh, in Latvia, certainly I can tell you, people said enough is enough. We do not want anymore none of this uh, it's going to be different and then when they discovered that it comes with for instance a great economic hardship when you tie your um, umbilical cord right. in an interim system some people were disappointed but they even then realize that there is a price to pay for for freedom there's a price to pay for your rights uh, and for your right to steer your own future according to your own intelligence or lack of it, that then remains to seen from the results. This is what democracy allows. It allows you to make mistakes and correct them. Other systems make mistakes, they cover them up, they bury them, and, and the system keeps rotting away and, and becoming worse. In democracy, hopefully, ideally, anything that goes wrong is open, is visible, and then you can tackle it, and you can correct it and improve it. Uh, Kingsley, what prospects do you see for democratic uh, process in Africa, not just Nigeria, but in large parts of Africa, uh, looking at the future? Well, I think the future will be shaped by today's young people in Africa. That's going to be the big decider of uh, how democracy works out in many African countries, because... We have now a generational, um, you know, element in, in the development of democracy. Many young people are idealistic about democracy. They want a better life. They want better economic opportunities. They're in touch with the rest of the world because of increasing globalization and technology. And because of that, they are increasingly rejecting the old ways of the, of the generation of political leaders in Africa uh, that have uh, we have had for the past 22 um, decades or so. So I think that's going to be a major, major uh, influence on, on the future of democracy in Africa. The, the demographic factor, about 60 to 65 percent of Africa's population is, is very young. And so they own the future. Now, the question is, of course, um, Benjamin Disraeli said, that you know the youth are the uh, guarantors of posterity of any country but i remember also that uh, herbert hoover um, said that well blessed are the youth for they will inherit the national debt um and in a country like nigeria this is a big complication our government is borrowing massively massively and many would say irresponsibly irresponsibly so you know, uh, and who's going to inherit this? Who's going to pay? It's the young people. So they will try to improve democracy, but they will also meet in some countries specific frustrations from the errors of their uh, preceding generations. But but in, in, in Kingston, in your neighborhood, you have ruler after ruler who uh, violates the two-term limit, 
changes the referendum uh, changes the, the constitution through a referendum organized uh, uh, you know with the help of a gun and they are just perpetuating themselves there are so many rulers who have been there for 25 30 years in so many countries so is is that going to change at all i mean you have look at chad look at mali look at uh, congo look at so many countries uh, uh, togo look at all the countries around you when is it going to change i believe again like i said the demographic factor will bring about a change um the people who are doing this um are still in many ways directly connected to the old order but if you look at the population of africa today that is below 35 uh between 20 to 35 they they think very differently uh from many even current political leaders um So the rule of law in African countries has been very very um challenged even in the context of democracy. I take uh, the, the the word that uh, Gunnar Sagerum uh, used undemocratic democracy. That's pretty much what we've seen in many African countries. In Nigeria there was an attempt at a third term um um in Obasanjo's time but it was some people were pushing it but it was um, it was shot down. So you know so yes I, i i understand the challenge but i believe that um yeah the demographic evolution will take care of this you mean obasanjo wanted a third term some people wanted him to have a third term he <laughs> says he didn't want to have a third term so okay. so we don't we don't know <laughs> but the important thing is that it did not work obasanjo of course was a, a very highly respected leader he was very effective um comparatively as a president yes and he's very much uh, respected and admired but he was he he has a military background you know so of course that element um vaira would know him uh, from the club of madrid i'm sure he's a good friend of mine and um, has played important roles in in our country i think the problem here is one of corruption isn't it i mean you are talking about leaders who are utterly corrupt who uh who have at the at the at the heart of things their own uh, interests and not the interests of the people i think esco was saying earlier about what distinguished the scandinavian countries the the distinguishing feature is of course the leadership you know at the end of the day they are competent they are straight you know and uh, you are dealing with a population which is highly educated and which will not hesitate to throw these leaders out if they do not perform you know? Yes. So for me for me uh, it's a major problem how do many of the countries in Asia and Africa actually do, deal with this kind of leadership even if they overthrow them the system is so entrenched in corruption and patronage that they can come back again you know like they did in Malaysia for instance yes that's right yeah. but that's that's I, true I think it's very important to understand that political leaders in democratic countries have to accept that uh, that they are operating under the law the same laws applied for individual citizens will be applied for leaders as well that is fundamental issue in democratic system but uh, randa hasn't that been threatened in the united states also with so many uh, more than 200 years of tradition of democracy so uh, well one time you have managed to overcome it but how do you look at the future prospects Do you see any threat at all in the US or do you think it's all settled now? Well, I don't think it's settled. I think it's an ever ever moving target, if you will, but on, on the justice issue, I think the first time we in America, at least that I can remember, that we saw a politician being punished, if you will, and not being above the law was probably Watergate. Watergate, President Richard Nixon was was sort of a watershed moment for Americans to say that even the president is not beyond the law it wasn't a crime that he was involved in of course it was the cover up afterwards and since then we've certainly seen our justice system take to task many members of congress um and other politicians who are corrupt who have misused their offices um and it seems to be stepping up a little bit now too as well We have some very high profile members of Congress that are under investigation. Our Justice Department, which is under our executive branch here in America, um has made it very clear that they are going after these members for violations that every other American would have been 
uh, thrown in jail for, if you will, or, or accused of. Um, so, so that's that part is working. Um, what I fear is our previous debates in America used to be about the Constitution and whether you were a strict constructionalist, whether you believed in the specific words of the Constitution, or whether you believed that the Constitution was an ever-evolving document, and albeit reflective of the democracy here in America. And now I think we're sort of falling into this idea of, you know, for instance, you know, getting back to the January 6th insurrection at our nation's capital and what happened there. The question becomes, do we have freedom of speech according to our Bill of Rights, according to our Constitution? It, you know, is the First Amendment freedom, does that extend to the president to say anything that he wants? Well, as we all learned in law school, there's a famous saying, you can't yell fire in a crowded theater. So there is no extent to freedom of speech that you can say anything you want. But now we have certain political leaders who are saying things that clearly aren't true. We have a cadre of individuals uh, who are following that particular leader on these untruths. And we've fallen into almost Alice in Wonderland, this sort of black hole yeah. that, well, of, of people saying whatever they want to say, whether it's true or not. And, you know, again, as a lawyer, I'm always seeking the truth and always seeking justice. And when I hear some of these things, I, I, I think that we should argue back on them. Um, but we're, we're, I, I think we're in a critical time and, and, and matching that certainly with what you've seen with individuals who believe in certain causes taking to the streets. So the greatest one is the mix of the power of the people to change the perception and what is going on in America with respect to our African-American community, our Black Lives Matter movement, has become a movement intersected with our judicial system and the abuse by our police officers in this, in this country. And, you know, we, I don't think idealistically, again, think that, you know, oh, we've gone through our civil rights movement, the 50s, the 60s, everything's okay. Well, it's not okay. And the first step to admitting that you have a problem is to certainly talk about it. And that's what Americans are doing right now. They're talking about it and they're doing something about it within the so Democratic we are, well, well, we are at a critical moment in the United States, as you said. But where are you been president of Club the Madri? Then you have an overview of what's happening around the world. Would you say globally democracy is at a critical time or not? There are some signs that are uh, that are worrisome, and uh, uh, both uh, the Club de Madrid uh, and another organization where I'm co-chair, the Nizami Ganjavi International Center, uh, we we follow international events and and try uh, and publish uh, opinions, uh, intervene, convince people, argue uh, about certain basic principles. And what are these basic principles? The first one is. Uh, that one must have rule of law in the sense that human life is considered something of value and worth protecting and respecting. If you have a system that theoretically, for instance, has the word democracy uh, in, uh, in the name of the country, it's almost a guarantee that it is not going to be a democracy. Uh, the second thing is freedom of thought. Uh, when, uh, when, as we have just uh, seen in the news, the North Korean leader is now imposing death penalties for people watching, uh, watching films or videos or information coming from South Korea, death penalty uh, for oh. watching film. Why is that? Because he realizes that freedom of thought is uh, dangerous for absolute dictators. Because freedom of thought leads to freedom of action. Thank you. Uh, we've got that, just one, one minute left. Uh, so that I think we have to guarantee freedom of access to information. But we must also guarantee that the information that is spread is not hate speech, uh, that it does not uh, incite to disrespect for any kind of category of human beings, 
um, and uh, that it does not incite to violence. There must be free speech, but with uh, strict legal limits on it. Thank you, Vera. We have one minute left. Well, that's almost getting over, but I'll give... I'll have last question for Kingsley. Kingsley, if you are elected president of Nigeria in the next election, what is the commitment are you going to make in front of all these people? So that Randa and Vaira and Esco can come back and hold you accountable for what you said today. Well, I'm going to work to make democracy real and I'm going to work to improve the living standards of Nigerians. Investments in education uh, from what uh, Esco said. So what, is the one thing, what is the one thing you will do for democracy to make democracy real? What is the one thing you will do to make democracy real? I will live by example. I will walk by example. I will hold myself accountable to the rule of law and my, my office. And that's something we don't see a lot. Okay. Thank you, Esko. Thank you, uh, Guna, Vera, Randa. And you heard what uh, Kingsley promised if he gets elected the president. If he deviates, uh, I have his email, private email. I can give it to you. Thank you very, very much. Good. Okay. Thanks. Thank very you. good. Bye bye. Thank you. It was bye. very nice bye. meeting everyone. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Bye. Thank bye. you. Bye. Uh, how do you get off? Um, I think there is a leave button somewhere. Yeah. Leave for me. It's in the left hand corner. Leave button. Mm -hmm. Oh yes. Okay. Great. Yeah. Bye bye. Yeah. Okay. Bye. bye. Thank you. Bye. Yeah. Bye. Thank you. Yeah.